Good morning students, I am Geeta Gangadharan, Associate Professor of English, Maharani's Arts College for Women, Mysore. Today, let us discuss the poem, Pied Beauty, written by Gerald Manley Hopkins. This poem is prescribed for the fifth semester optional English students of the University of Mysore. Hopkins lived in the Victorian age, but his poetry is considered to be modern. His ideas as well as language and style of writing are quite different from that of his contemporaries. Hopkins was a Jesuit priest. His profound religious faith becomes very obvious in poem after poem. The present poem also glorifies God. You may read poems like God's grandeur, the art in the just Lord, etc. to understand his faith further. Hopkins never published his works. His friend and poet Robert Bridges published his works long after his death. The poet died in the year 1889. Pied Beauty was written in 1877, but published in 1918. The poem Pied Beauty is a curtal sonnet. A traditional or conventional sonnet consists of 14 lines. We have already discussed it at length. You may go back to my lecture on Shall I Compare Thee, where I have explained in great detail about the two different types of sonnets, that is the Shakespearean sonnet and the Petrarchan sonnet. Pied Beauty is a sonnet curtailed in length. Contrary to the 14 lines that we come across in a conventional sonnet, here we come across ten and a half lines, six plus four and a half lines. The poem is written in sprung rhythm. According to the poet, sprung rhythm is nearest to the rhythm of prose, the least forced and the most rhetorical. There are two important concepts of Hopkins which we must understand when we try to explore Hopkins' poems. These are concepts of inscape and in stress. I repeat concepts of inscape and in stress. Hopkins borrowed the ideas from the medieval theologian and philosopher Dun Scotus. Probably because of the influence of Scotus, his poems have been the meeting point of the poet and the priest. At once you can see the artistic brilliance of a poet and the profound faith of a priest merging together to create an exemplary work of art. The ascetic and the aesthetic aspects bind together to give an enriching experience to the readers. Both nature and religion become central to Hopkins' poems. The world is charged with the grandeur of God and there lives the dearest freshness, deep down things, says the poet in the poem. God's grandeur. Now coming back to the concept of inscape and instress. Inscape is the unique inner nature or quality of an object or a person that differentiates it from the other things. Instress is the actual experience the reader has of inscape. If instress makes things alike, the fact that all things are full of inscape 
means that things are alike and be unlike. This is from the article titled The Univocal Chinese by J. Ellis Miller. I repeat the quote, if interest makes things alike, the fact that all things are full of inscape means that things are alike and be unlike. Now, in very simple terms, inscape is the unique qualities of an individual, those qualities which differentiates an individual from the others in the group or in the species or whatever. And instress is the experience of inscape, the reader has. Instress is the experience the reader has of inscape. Now coming to the poem, the poem is deceptively simple and short. It deals with profound philosophical thoughts. I will read out the poem before analyzing the lines. Pied beauty. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a branded cow. For rose molds all in stipple upon trout that swim. Fresh fine cold chestnut falls, finches wings. Landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and claw. And all trades their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled. Who knows how? With swift, slow, sweet, sore, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Thus goes the point. Pied means multicolored or variegated. The poem, Pied Beauty, begins and ends with the expression of faith in God or the creator of this universe. Glory be to God for dappled things. Thus begins the poem. Hopkins concludes by saying, Praise him for all the complex presence of contrast and the many colors of qualities that infuse this universe with the inexplicable beauty. Who knows how? Let us glorify God for all the dappled things around us. Dappled means spotted. Hopkins lists out a few of the dappled things to give us a feel of it. The couple colored sky, generally blue and white or blue and black, etc., is compared to a branded or a spotted cow. That is, sorry, spotted cow. Now, next, the trout is a freshwater fish. There are brown trouts and rainbow trouts with different kinds of spots or rose moles all over their bodies. If you browse the net, you will see many pictures of trouts. The fallen chestnuts are compared to fresh fire coal. The chestnuts are covered by a dark brown outer shell, whereas when it breaks open, we will see the bright reddish shade of brown inside. These chestnuts are compared to the coals in live fire, outwardly black and glowing from within, from inside. The finches are small birds with colorful wings. Thereafter, the poet talks about landscape. Landscape may be plotted and pieced. Some part of the landscape is left for cattle grazing, fold. Some part is left uncultivated temporarily to re regain its fertility, fallow. 
and others are ploughed getting ready for cultivation. Hopkins finally talks about the different trades that man is engaged in. Each trade, for example, may be farming, carpentry, fishing, etc. Each of these trades employs its own diverse equipments. They employ their own equipments, their own materials. For each trade, these materials are different, equipments are different. So be it God's own creation, like the cows, the finches, the chestnuts, etc. Or man-made, like the landscape or the trade, we will find the variety and richness in everything, making it at once unique and common. No branded cows, trouts or finches are alike. No two branded cows, not this very specially. See, uh, in one sense, all cows are the same because they are all cows. But if you go deeper into what Hopkins is trying to communicate to us, we understand that each cow is different from the other cow. No two branded cows, trouts or finches are alike. Although they belong to the same species of cow, trout or finches, yet they are unique in their own way. At once they are same and different. In short, the relation of sameness and difference of one and the many of general and specific pervades the whole universe. Further, Hopkins speaks about certain qualities of things around him. All things counter, original, spare and strange. Things that are counter may be opposite to one another. Things that are original, distinctive, not falling in line, unique. Things that are spare, a standalone thing like a spare part. Things that are strange, deviation from the normal or conventional or the expected or maybe things that are perhaps beyond our comprehension, perhaps partially if not wholly. Whatever is fickle, not fixed or constant. Whatever is fickle. Whatever is freckled with some distortions. That is, whatever is freckled. No one knows how this amazing universe is created. If we ponder over, we realize that the universe is a summation of juxtapositions. There is no limit or boundary set to its diversity or its variety. Therefore, the poet wonders over the mystery of creation. Who knows how such a diverse and distinct universe is created? These creations are bestowed with opposing qualities as well. Swift and slow, sweet and sore, a dazzle and dim. And who is the father of these creations? He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. God's beauty set against the beauty of the universe is eternal, is changeless, is permanent. He whose beauty is beyond change is the author of the pile the beauty of the universe. Praise him for the infinite variety, piedness, dappledness that he has created. So you see, glory be to God for the for dappled things. That's how he begins. And now praise him for he has created 
all the dangly things, all the variety, all the contrasts, making this world a rich and beautiful one. Now, I need to acknowledge um, the, sorry, I need to, it's, uh, my reading of Hopkins is uh, influenced by J. Hillis Miller's essay, The Univocal Chinese. So I, I have quoted a few words and lines here and there, and I conclude my analysis of the poem Pipe Beauty uh, by quoting from the same article, Univocal Chinese. God's beauty is past change. He is single and eternal, not at all fickle or freckled. But this God of undifferentiated oneness has fathered forth the pied universe. God and the universe have the relation of pied beauty. The eternity, changelessness and unity of God are set against the temporality, spatiality, self-division and changefulness of the world. Thank you students. I would suggest that you read the poem several times, keeping your minds open. Don't give up. I know that it is a um, seemingly simple poem, a very short one. But when you read, you realize that it is definitely not as simple as it seems to be. However, if you read it repeatedly, then listen to the lecture. Once again, go back to the poem. I'm very sure that you will start appreciating the poem very soon. Thank you.